Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. This is my first time in Berlin, and I love the city so far. Today, I'm going to be talking about poor programming practices and how to avoid them. And the reason why I wanted to give this talk was when I first started programming, I had this mentality of just ship it first and then clean it up later. It wasn't long that I started to realize that this mentality was dangerous, but I wanted to hit all of my deadlines, and I thought impressing my coworkers through speed was the best way. So soon after, I would read the code, and I would be like, this is so confusing. Who wrote this? Only to realize that actually, that was me. My bad. So I realized that these poor practices is not bad just because they're hard to understand, but also they tend to sustain throughout the code base because developers like to mimic other people's code. And so today, I will be talking about four poor programming practices that I've seen a lot in the code base and how the solutions to them are actually quite simple. In order to do this, I have developed a demo application. Um, you can check it out on my GitHub, and it's actually very easy. All it is is I sign in into the application, and I see my profile, and then I can search other people and see their profile as well and follow them. This application only took about 500 lines of code to write. But what you don't realize is that there are mistakes within this code base that is going to cause a ton of tech debt over time. And although this application is small, yours probably isn't. And so you might be looking at months of tech debt. Again, this is on my GitHub, and I actually have solutions to every single stage that I'm talking about. And you can compare the changes uh, of the code and see what the changes are. So let's get started. Problem number one. Our first problem is simple. We have a simple UI, but for some reason, it's a lot more difficult to add features than I initially intended. Let's look at the design. Over here, we can see that I am following 25 pinners. And in my new design, all I want to do is change the text to say that you are following 25 pinners. Or if it's someone else's uh, for, um, profile, the pinner fragment, Ben is following X number of pinners. Seems easy enough, right? However, adding this simple change is not a one-line change. Why is that? Well, I've decided that there are actually commonalities between these two fragments. And so rather than redoing the code over and over, I thought it was a good idea to extract out that logic and put it into a base class. And so the logic in the base class would have the avatar view, the description, and all of that data in order to get that API and um, put it into that view. This is what my base class looks like. Perhaps you already see some changes, um, some methods in this uh, class that are a red flag. So our first code smell is that we have protected member variables. Protected member variables means that we're increasing the scope of our member variables so that they can be changed in any of the classes that inherit that parent class. Now, when we update that member variable, it could be in the child classes or the parent class, and that can cause a lot of bugs and a headache to debug over time. Our second problem is that we have logic in the base class that can change. In this case, I just want to update the following text, and yet this following text is in the base class, and so now I have to add some conditional statements or maybe even pull out that logic of changing the following text out of the base fragment. Finally, in my inherited classes, I'm actually overriding this method. And so my final code smell is that I'm overriding and re-implementing logic over and over again. And there's a way to do this where we don't have to do this. So in this case, there isn't that much work to do. It's only two fragments, and it's inheriting from a single base fragment. But what if we multiply the number of fragments we had? Let's suppose we were doing A-B tests on all of these fragments. Well, now, instead of two instances that I have to change, I have six different instances. This is what we call inheritance hell. And we want to avoid this 
So what's the solution? Well, this is a classic example of using the wrong architecture strategy. When we think about these commonalities between the two views, let's think about what the relationship is. We describe inheritance as an is relationship. On the other side, there is composition. Composition is a has relationship. And when we look at these two views, does it make sense to describe these two commonalities, the avatar, as has or is? When you think about it logically, it makes total sense that these two fragments should have the avatar view rather than it should inherit the avatar view. And so our previous architecture looks something like this. And our new architecture is just that we have my profile, which contains the avatar view, and the pinner fragment that also contains the avatar view. This is what the avatar view now looks like. And we made some great improvements. We have private member variables, and so it can only be changed within the avatar class. And secondly, we're actually pass passing through custom parameters. So when we want to update that follow text, we're not updating it through um, the class itself, but actually through the method. Our key takeaway here is that we should be deliberate with inheritance. We should think about using composition first. And in order to do this, we should be intentional about how we think about declaring our class. And so we should annotate that with final, or in Kotlin, it's already closed from the get-go. We should use inheritance when the is relationship makes sense. And as an abstract example, a vehicle has tires, and a truck is a type of vehicle. And in our Android fragment, we're using inheritance when we're cu creating custom fragments. All right, problem number two. So we're going to move a little bit further away from view hierarchy, and we're going to talk a little bit more about events. So this problem is that I have a lot of bugs related with my follow button. Why is that? Let's look at the views one more time. We can see that when I click on the follow button, I just want the change, um, my profile to change so that it says that I'm following 26 pinners instead of 25. Seems like an easy um, thing to do. However, as we add more and more fragments, this becomes more difficult. For some reason, people are reporting bugs that the update to the uh, profile fragment is not counting correctly. So why is it that this is happening? Well, the reason behind all of this is that I decided to use a library called EventBus. And EventBus is a published subscribe library. And at the very implementation level, it is a global event queue. So when you think about sending events from EventBus, when the publisher sends events, it's going into this queue where it has no idea where that queue is going to go, where the events are going to go. And the events that are coming out of it, the subscriber has no idea where those events are coming from. So at the very crux, it's a black box. When we look at the code, however, it's super easy to implement. And when I click on the follow button, I just create a new event saying that the follow um, count has changed. And on the subscriber side, I listen to that event and update the following count. So why is it breaking? Well, in this case, we have a single event that's being sent. However, as we add more fragments, we now have more publishers and more subscribers. That means that those publishers might be sending events that have conditions that might not relate to the new subscribers that I'm creating. And on the subscriber side, that subscriber um, might not even be alive. It's directly um, dependent on the life cycle, and we have no idea if we're sending events, and those events are being actually listened to and handled. So because it's decoupled, event bus libraries have many pitfalls. 
there is no enforced responsibility of ensuring that something is listening. And as we add more events, it decreases the reliability and the maintainability of the code. On top of all of that, it is a pain to write tests for. Now, before I go further, I don't want to completely bash EventBus. It's just that this time, using EventBus for UI updates doesn't make sense in this use case. We should be using EventBus when the client does not care if the events are being consumed. And so a good example of this is we're, if we're doing logging events or performance events, or perhaps creating a service where we don't care whether or not that service is being launched. Our solution is to just reintroduce the observer pattern that we've seen throughout the code base in our click handlers and et cetera. We have this follow listener, and we have a following count change. And on the profile side, we implement that following listener, and we set that following count. And on the publisher side, we register the follow listener, and we also notify when the following count has changed. So our key takeaway here is that event bus libraries are often abused due to its simplicity. UI updates is not a great use case that benefits from loose coupling, which is what event bus is. And we should use event bus where loose coupling makes sense, i.e. for logging. All right. So our third problem is actually related to our previous problem of sending events. Let's take a further look at this events. And we wonder, why is it that I even need to use event bus in order to update the UI in the first place? Well, when I think about this, maybe I could just come back to the fragment, my profile fragment, and every time I come back to it, I could call the API so that the data is always up to date. However, I don't want to do this because that introduces latency in my application. And so I cache these, um, the users in order to prevent latency. And so I have something like this. My profile fragment has my user, and it has a following count. The pinner fragment also needs my user, and it also needs the current user. At this point, what I really want to do is base palm. This is because I'm maintaining state within all of my fragments. And if I had more than just two fragments, that means that I have to maintain data consistency between all of those fragments somehow. And I'm using something like observables or events in order to hack my way around this. So in this fragment, what are some of the red flags? Well, our first code smell is that we're caching models on a fragment basis. Again, this leads us to maintaining model consistency through different hacks in order to get this to work. Our second code smell is that we have model-dependent logic and then view layer. We have this check to see if my user is null, and otherwise, um, I can update the view. And this logic is really ugly, and it's also um, going to introduce bugs. So that is just one use case where it indicates poor data consistency. In our example, we're using UI to track instances of model state. But there are a slew of examples where you could be introducing poor data consistency into your application. Perhaps you have public static variables where you're updating throughout your application just because you just need something in order to track a single variable. Another thing is that you might have singleton patterns. So you have a singleton pattern, and you have this one variable that you want to keep a track of, and so you set it in that singleton. This is really bad. Our solution is kind of obvious. We should just have a central area in order to handle storing and retrieval of all of these models. 
we call this a repository. And that repository can be as simple or as complex as it needs to be. So in our case, we just have the memory cache and the networking layer. And whenever we need to retrieve a model, we ask the repository to return us a model. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's coming from the cache or the network. The repository will figure out that logic for you. So this is our solution code for retrieving a user model. We have a repository listener. I'm reintroducing that observable pattern. And we have on success an error. And in my user repository, when I load the user, I have the repository listener that I'm passing in um, through the uh, method. And I have the central cache check in order to figure out whether or not I want to return the user. And also, I have a central network call in order to update the model once I have a better, um, a fresh model. That means that I'll always have the freshest model within my repository and nowhere else in the code base. Lastly, um, we have a simple call in order to update the view after that repository returns the correct model. Now, before I move on, you're probably thinking about, wait, what about RxJava? What about live data? There's a lot of different solutions that help us with this. And you're absolutely right. There is, in this use case, I'm not thinking about a lot of examples that could get much more complex. Um, there's a lot of asynchronous communication problems that could be solved with, um, that is difficult to solve with an observable pattern. And if I ever want to do operations on those events, where those events are coming in, and I want to either chain those data calls or return more than one data response, or I just want a better reactive model, RxJava is a great solution to this. There are libraries that adapt um, the network calls, such as Retrofit, in order to RxJava observables for you. <coughs> so our key takeaway here is that we should be building a central way to fetch and retrieve models. So stop storing your instances of your models in all your fragments. We should ensure data consistency regardless of whether we're storing or retrieving our models. And we should store it in a central area, a repository. Let's move on to our final problem. So, our final problem is that we have no unit tests. And this sucks, but it's not that I didn't intend to write uni any unit tests. It's just that they were so difficult. It was almost more difficult than writing the class itself. Why is that? We just want to ensure that certain aspects of our view is properly displayed. So why is that that we Writing these unit tests is so complex. Well, here is what a typical fragment looks like. We have the UI, the animations, the networks, models, Android services, logging, caching, etc. And all we really want to test is the business logic. So why is it that we have all of this information just in our fragments? So here is my profile fragment. And here is a snippet of code in that profile. What are some of the red flags here? Well, in order to write unit tests, we have to mock the network callback. We also have to mock the translation of the response to the model. And on top of all of that, we need to use um, electro, RoboElectric in order to mock the Android framework UI. This is a lot of work just to mock a single method call. So let's make it easier. How should we write this unit test? Well, what we really want to do is we just want to validate that the correct fields are actually um, set. <coughs> 
we want to validate that the avatar is getting the correct name, the image URL, and also updating the following text. So how do we do this? So our solution is to just separate concerns through an interface. You probably heard of the paradigms, MVVM, MVP, MVI, and it was actually very interesting to me to understand why it is that we're incorporating all of these paradigms. And a key value here, all of these paradigms are different, but a key value here is that they separate concerns between areas that don't need to know about each other. So now you can communicate between classes without knowing the internals. In this example, I'm going to use MVP. So we have this fragment here, and in order to separate out the business logic, we have a view interface, and that's separated um, by the presenter is where we have the business logic. On the other side, we have a contract that is the data source that separates the models, the repository. So this one is an example of where loose coupling actually makes sense. When we have abstractions away from the business logic, we can write tests better. So in order to do this, we just have to separate things using an interface. So first, we define a contract for the view. This is my profile, and it just has the methods that are needed in order to update the profile. So I have update avatar view and update following count. And we implement that profile here. So all of this logic I've already written before, I'm just implementing that interface. Our second part is to just define a contract for the repository. So we have the user data source, and we're loading my user and passing in the repository listener. And then we're implementing that user data source in the user repository. So this is what the code looks like, and we made some great improvements. First of all, we're no longer referencing the repository, and thus that data source is a lot easier to mock out, and we don't have to mock out the network calls. We no longer need to mock out the Android framework view because that view that we passed in is our own custom interface. And lastly, we no longer need to mock out the network callback because the repository listener is our own um, observable. So in order to do this, we need an MVP framework to function, but I don't want to get too much into this because there are so many different talks talking about um, pros and cons of MVP, MVVM, and MVI. And I've added some links of reading material at the end of this talk so that you can listen and um, figure out what paradigm is best for you. So what does writing the unit test look like now? Well, it looks exactly like what I wanted it to look like before. I'm just validating that I'm updating the avatar and updating the following text. And all I need to do in order to mock out those interfaces is use a mocking library called Makito. So again, um, separation of concerns is not just good for writing um, testable code, but it also improves understandability of the code. That code that you're writing with all of those animations and complex view updates can be quite long, and it detracts from the logic of the code base. And so increasing, um, it also allows us to increase reusability of the code base. Now we have views that are modular and can be reused. It can also be used in building libraries and modularizing the code base. So our key takeaway here is that unit tests are easy to write when you separate out the business logic. So choose a paradigm that makes sense, MVP, MVVM, MVI, to separate the concerns, and use the interfaces to extract away the internals, such as a mocking library.
This improves testability and also understandability of the code base. So that is all. And before I um, recap the video, uh, recap the talk, I just wanted to point out something that um, an audience member uh, talked to me about um, when I was at Joy-Con Boston presenting this, which is the solid principle. A lot of the information that I talked about today, it doesn't apply to just Android. I'm just using Android as an example. And the solo principle is a great way to understand the theory behind ob object-oriented programming languages, which is that classes should have a single responsibility. We should have um, classes only have a certain type of um, implementation, and we, won't, we don't want to change abstract classes um, over time. So as a recap, I've talked about four poor programming practices, and hopefully you found this insightful or serve as a good reminder as you're busy coding. Um, to recap, first, we abstracted out the common visual components using inheritance, and that actually made our lives harder as we added new features. So we should be deliberate about thinking about inheritance and think about using composition instead. Secondly, we were trying to send events in order to update UI, and we were using EventBus, which is a loosely coupled library. But we should use tight coupling patterns, like observables, or using the RxJava library instead. Third, we should create a central location in order to uh, store data, because we don't want to maintain model state throughout our code base. And lastly, Separating areas of concerns will allow us to increase testability and maintenance of our code base. So here are the suggested reading materials and learning about how to create really modular applications and um, understanding a little bit more about MVC, MVM, et cetera. And that's all. Um, you can find my slides on this link, and feel free to ask me any questions. So we have quite some time left. So are there any questions? Anyone, any question? Like, I would be... Um, interest if you could share like some of your experiences applying this to large projects versus maybe um, because like sometimes if there's like if you have live operations and something isn't working you must be fast right. but very often I find you know like being fast and um, being very um, maintainable and clean yeah add two um, sides of one continuum can you maybe share some of the insights you gained at Pinterest on this? Yeah, honestly, a lot of um, thinking about these per practices, and especially I, I see that a lot of people make these mistakes all the time, and a lot of it is just because um, they're really in the zone and thinking about how to come up with this feature without thinking about the full solution. And so even though inheritance versus composition does seem like a very um, simple thing to get. It's so easy to just caught up, be caught up and be like, well, that looks so similar to this other fragment that I have. Why don't I just like extend it and change a few things? And it'll just lead to a huge hierarchy over time. So yeah, a lot of it is just thinking uh, before you push out that diff. Every time, no matter the timing, the time pressure, yeah? Yeah, I'm just I mean, curious, yeah? It, like you can always add to dos and you know like okay. say you have um, you want to improve the code over time, but it's always better to think about how I can um, make changes in order to pr improve the code base before I even send out that diff. And what I would often do is um, I would send out a, uh, a diff and then afterwards I would clean mm -hmm. it up mm -hmm. um, and try to make it better. Are there any other questions from the audience?
Okay, so thank you very much, Alice. Thank you.